Um, but today, we're going to learn about Junaleska. Junaleska is one of the oldest continuously occupied African American communities in Western North Carolina. The little community began to take root in Boone, adjacent to the downtown area, in the years following the Civil War. Junaleska has endured there ever since, although many in the area remain unaware of its existence. Generations have called Junaleska home and still do today. A new book of oral histories of members of the Junaleska community has just been published. It is the first ever comprehensive history of the community in the residents own voices. The book Junaleska Oral Histories of a Black Appalachian Community was released by McFarland Publishing, a leading independent publisher of academic nonfiction on Juneteenth, 2020. The book is co-edited by Dr. Susan Keith and the Junaleska Heritage Association. The Junaleska Heritage Association was formed in 2011, and it is a community-based organization dedicated to preserving cultural heritage and protecting the neighborhood in Boone, North Carolina. Land and home ownership have been crucial to this community of closely interconnected extended families and neighbors. Junaleska's church is one of a handful of African-American Mennonite Brethren churches in the United States. The Boone Mennonite Brethren Church has provided one of the few avenues for leadership in the local black community through the years. The book is comprised of 36 life history narratives adapted from interviews with residents born between 1885 and 1993. And it offers a people's history of the black experience in the Southern mountains. Their stories provide a unique glimpse into the lives of African Americans in Appalachia during the 20th century and a community determined to survive into the next. Uh, and just a little bit more about our speakers. Uh, Dr. Susan Keefe is a professor emerita of anthropology at Appalachian State University, where she taught for 38 years. Her publications include seven books and monographs and over 40 articles and chapters in professional journals and edited books. Uh, Dr. Keefe began her work in Junaleska, the African-American neighborhood in Boone in 1989. And she also has worked with the community most recently as a member of the Junaleska Heritage Association and co-editor of their book, Junaleska Oral Histories of a Black Appalachian Community. And she has called Blowing Rock her home since 1978, but currently has been in California since COVID. So thank you for joining us from the other side of the country, Sue. And then Roberta Jackson, is facilitator for the Junaleska Heritage Association. And she's a lifelong resident of the community and a graduate of Appalachian State University. She's worked in the physical plant department at ASU for 30 years. And Roberta is secretary of the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church and serves as a member of the Watauga County Library Board, the Appalachian Regional Library Board, and the Digital Watauga Board. So uh, please join me in welcoming Roberta Jackson and Dr. Sue Keith. Thank you. Willard, um, I thought I would start out uh, speaking and um, let me see if I can get a better view here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having us. Uh, we're real pleased to be here. And um, I wanted to start out by just got, kind of giving a little background of how I ended up uh, on this project. Uh, it's been a long time in the making. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting personal history for me. Uh, I started, uh, I came to Boone in 1978 and uh, uh, became a member of the anthropology department at ASU. Uh, and um, prior to that, I had done research with Mexican American communities in uh, Southern California. So I was interested in ethnicity in general in the United States. And um, after I got tenure and uh, had sort of established myself in the department, in 1988, I wanted to find a project that my students could work on. Uh, and so I had heard about the June Leska community. It was only a few blocks from town. And uh, so 
I thought it might make an interesting project for students to get involved with. So I got a College of Arts and Sciences grant uh, for that summer in 1988 and employed two of my very best students, Marie Braswell and Marie Mackey, to interview uh, residents in Junaluska. They interviewed 27 uh, people. And I started to uh, get to know a little bit about the community myself, doing some particip participant observation. I started taking field notes. Uh, I attended the, the, the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church and got to know some of the residents. And then in uh, 1993, the town of Boone condemned the historic uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, the Black Church, the one that was built in 1898 in the community. It had uh, lost membership and was closed by the Methodists in uh, 1986 and had fallen into disrepair. So I organized some students and uh, an archaeologist in our department, Tom White, who was interested, and we, we tried to make some changes to the stabilize the building. Uh, it was ultimately unsuccessful and in 1986, uh, 1996, it was uh, demolished. But during that time, uh, one of my students, uh, Jody Manrose, undergraduate, wrote her senior honors thesis on, uh, on the Methodist Episcopal Chapel. And then she and I published an article in uh, the Appalachian Journal in 1999 about, about the church and its demise. And then in uh, the 2000s, in, in 2002, I uh, was called on by Virgil and Jennifer Greer and June Leska, who were concerned about you know, uh, some old, many of the older people, residents of the community didn't have um, uh, couldn't pay their heating bills and couldn't maintain their homes very well. And so uh, I collaborated with them in doing some fundraising projects. And also they helped me produce a map of the community. Uh, so this is a, uh, a map that was done for the book that was just published, but it's taken from the original map that we produced in 2004 uh, Virgil and, and, and Jennifer and I, and a couple of my students. Um, so you can see Appalachian State University down at the bottom of that map. Uh, you can see King Street and Queen Street and, uh, and North Depot Street, uh, where the public library is located at the corner of Queen and North Depot. And then uh, the Junaluska community, the cluster of homes there around uh, North Street and Church Street and Tremont Drive. And then the community continues on up uh, to the left on June Leska Road, uh, which June Leska Road goes up to the top of Howard's Knob. And there are, um, historically, there were uh, uh, black residences located all along that road, uh, but the ones that are in existence today are pictured on the map there. So uh, we produced this map so that I could get to better understand the boundaries of the community. And then in 2011, as Willard said, the uh, June Leska Heritage Association was formed out of a collaboration of St. Luke's Epis Episcopal Church and the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church. And the purpose was to preserve Junaluska and its cultural heritage. And uh, they, um, the group uh, over the years has done a number of things, including uh, putting together Jubilees. This is from the 2015 Junaluska Jubilee. Uh, the Jubilees were meant to um, make more visible the community to the larger community of Boone. Um, so I worked with them and uh, uh, doing those things. And, uh, and then 
the uh, Junaluska community was very interested in working on their history, uh, their community history, their family genealogies. <clears throat> and so I joined their effort and, um, and we together um, uh, conducted about 16 interviews of residents in the community and uh, did three focus groups. Uh, and so the book contains uh, narratives based on the interviews from my 1988 students, interviews, uh, the ones the Junaluska Heritage Association and I conducted recently, and then also 27 interviews that came from the W.L. Urey uh, Appalachian Collection at ASU, which uh, houses uh, a lot of uh, interviews, historic interviews, and the ones that, the 27 interviews that we collected from there were primarily done by Dr. Winston Kinsey, who was in the history department uh, at ASU. So <clears throat> all of these interviews were collected together and uh, formed the basis of the, most of the book. So the success of the book comes from uh, my long-term collaboration with uh, the Junaluska community on projects of mutual interest um, and our developing trust in one another in, uh, in terms of trying to understand the history of the community. So I just wanna turn things over now to uh, Roberta, who is going to tell us a little bit more uh, about the Junaluska Heritage Association, which we often refer to as the JHA. Roberta? I'd just like to say we appreciate Sue and all that she has done to make us known to the town of Boone and the surrounding areas because it wasn't until recently, I'd say 2011, that I realized that there were a lot of people that didn't know that our community was here and that it, uh, it was part of our goal to let people know we're here and we've been contributing for centuries. So the first thing I wanna talk about is our mission. Our mission statement was to collect, curate, and celebrate the cultural heritage of the Junaluska neighborhood of Boone, North Carolina. And then I was going to just say some of the things that we've done since 2011. We always like to have a project that's always ongoing that keeps us on our toes, I guess you'd say. Uh, and I've got five, six sheets of paper of all the things we've done. So I'm gonna to try to narrow them down a little bit. Uh, the Junaluska Heritage Association, a community-based organization, was formed in February 2011 to help preserve Junaluska's rapidly vanishing cultural heritage and to assist in preserving and growing the community itself. Members of the community, along with members of St. Luke's Episcopal Church, participated in a two-day long workshop on race Racism and Community Building in September 2012. This was at the Mennonite Brethren Church and at ASU's library in 2014. These workshops were led by our Reverend Jim Abbott and others from the Asheville area. In, those, in between those two sessions, there were only half day workshops for the two separate communities. Uh, St. Luke's and Reverend Cindy Banks began a social justice training group that used these sessions as part of their bi-weekly meeting during 2013 and 2014. We also have a website that really needs to be updated, but you can find it. And if you'd like to know where to find it, look up junaluskahistory.org. Okay, and residents of the Junaluska community jointly created a community quiz with individual blocks commemorating memorial events in the life of residents. This beautiful and meaningful quiz now 
quilt now hangs in the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church in the heart of the community. We also created a large banner with a brief history of Judaluska and photographs of many residents from days gone by, and it hangs on permanent display in the Watauga County Library. The library has also provided a permanent JHA file drawer where we are compiling information about the community and our organization to be available to the public. We know because of COVID-19 that there has been some, I don't know how, I don't think the library is open to the public available like it was, but that file cabinet is there. And if you're ever in there, ask them where it is and they'll show you. In March, 2013, the Junaluska Heritage Association was part of a program of the Appalachian Studies Association Annual Conference at Appalachian State University in Boone. The title of the present panel presentation was the Junaluska Heritage Association, a Black Appalachian Community Studies Its History. Panel participants included Dr. Key, moderator, of the ASU Department of Anthropology and Junaluska residents, Lynn Patterson, Roberta Jackson, Carolyn Grimes, and Sandy Hagler. Uh, Junaluska has also participated twice in the popular and well-attended Boone Heritage Day event held on a yearly basis in September. I don't think that was held last year or the year before, but we enjoyed being a part of that. Um, the community was featured in a documentary entitled The African American Experience in the High Country, which aired on SkyBest TV and was also in November 2014, one of the final screenings of the 8th Annual Alexandria Virginia Film Festival. This festival presents a diverse and imaginary array of films feature film documentaries and shorts by U.S. and foreign filmmakers, and we were glad to be a part of that. Uh, then we were also working in conjunction with the Boone Historic Preservation Commission and other interested friends to save and preserve the old Jordan Council Cemetery, almost forgotten historic black cemetery in the center of the town of Boone. And we have worked on this, I don't know how many years, I'm sure Sue would remember, but we finally got this accomplished with the help of ASU, the town of Boone, a lot of interested people who raised the money and had a monument put there in the old city cemetery. The town of Boone are a fence it in for us and made it a good, nice, cemetery. Oh, I didn't know she had that picture. Well, that was the day it was dedicated. It was October 1st, 2017. Uh, in January of 2014, we purchased and donated three books on African American genealogy research to the Watauga County Library and the Belt Library at Appalachian State University. So if you're interested in using those research books, just ask at both of the libraries, they should have them. We were also the topic of a feature article in Western North Carolina Magazine's January, February, 2014 edition. Um, I'm going through these because we've got quite a few. Uh, on March 26, Roberta Jackson, facilitator of the Junaluska Heritage Association and her daughter Lynn made a presentation to the Boone Kiwanis Club about Junaluska and its history. On December 10, 2014, an, ad, an exhibit about the Junaluska community compiled by students of Dr. Andrea Burns introduction to public history class was unveiled, unveiled in ASU's Belt Library, and it was a great exhibit. It was there through April of 2015. 
Now, I'm going to stop because I could go on forever. But our current project right now is signage for the cemetery, the black cemetery that's being used now. And it's located on the west end of town, but there's not a sign there. So we're in the process of getting that done. And we have some really good people in our association that works to get these projects done. So I don't know whether it'll be finished this year or not, but we're working on that. Oh, and I forgot, and I'll let you go with all this. There was, there is some signage that the uh, Historic Preservation Commission was responsible for having a sign marker done for the Junaluska community. Right now it's on order, and I'm not quite sure when it will be here. But once it's here, we're gonna have a ceremony and install that marker right at the hill, right at the street below Junaluska. So we'll keep everybody informed. If you'd like to come, we'd sure be glad to have you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah, I think the Junaluska Heritage Association has done quite a bit in its short history. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the oral history book now. And um, as I said, uh, I work together with the community because of our mutual interest in community history and family history. Uh, and uh, I am not uh, a historian and I haven't really done oral history before, but oral history shares a lot uh, of the same perspectives with anthropology. Uh, we are both interested in the participants' point of view. That is, uh, what can the people tell us uh, rather than the experts? And secondly, we're both interested in narrative. We're interested in telling a story uh, about people's lives in a way that's meaningful to them. So I could contribute my experience with editing and, and in the publishing world. And the community members, of course, had a deep knowledge of their community and their history. And so our common goal was to bring greater visibility to June Luska, as, as Roberta was mentioning. Uh, and I have to say, when I was teaching at ASU, it was rare for me to find students who knew about the community, even though it was only, you know, a few blocks away. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the approach that we took in doing this research. Uh, it's the uh, participatory research method. This comes out of a paradigm called participatory development. And uh, most development in the world takes place, uh, and academic research takes place sort of top down. It's the experts coming in and um, uh, collecting information and, and uh, analyzing it and, and then walking away after the development is done. So in contrast, what participatory research uh, does is to incorporate community members from day one at every stage. So in, from the research design to the data collection, the analysis of the data, and then in publication. And what participatory research does is to strengthen the stakeholders uh, who gain confidence in, in doing the research. They gain research skills and of course, leadership experience. So it is a way to empower people uh, in, in their own communities. And participatory research is also important because it better ensures accuracy <laughs> because people can check on uh, what's been written. Uh, and it uh, also increases the researchers access to data because if people are participating in the, re in the research, uh, they're more likely to want to share uh, more. And then finally, it, it contributes to the community's access to the results, which is important. And members of the Junaluska community, when I talked to them early on, were really disappointed that researchers would come in, they'd you know, interview some people, they'd leave, and, and they never heard anything about what you know, what happened? They never got the interviews back. They, they didn't know where the data went. So it was very disappointing. Okay, I'm gonna 
screen share a little bit here again. So this is the cover of the book and it has the community quilt that uh, Roberta was talking about that was made and, and is hanging in the church. Uh, it was made in 2014 <clears throat> by members of the community. Um, so I, I wanna just describe briefly what the book entails. It, it has a brief introduction by me and then the 36 life history narratives, which are the bulk of the book. And uh, those are uh, from people who were born between 1885 and 1993. So the book really covers over a century of life in the Junaluska community. And, uh, and so it's a pretty impressive uh, uh, picture of, of what went on in the community during that time. So it was conceived at the beginning as a community history by community members uh, with me as one of the editors, assisted by the JHA who are co-editors. And because of the process, the community really sees it as their book, which it is. Uh, it fosters uh, community pride. It fosters uh, their own self-identity. Uh, and by working on the book, they've come to better understand who they are. Uh, and, and of course, it allows them to pass on this knowledge to their children and grandchildren, which is extremely important to them. So I wanna say a little bit about the writing process. Uh, we began really working on the book in 2016 when uh, I uh, brought together the interviews that we had done uh, recently along with those other uh, interviews that I mentioned, and uh, <clears throat> made sure they were all transcribed, where there were multiple interviews for a single resident. Uh, I collect, collapsed those into a single life history narrative. Um, and uh, I, in the process of editing the narratives, I did clean them up to make a readable document. So uh, they are not interviews preserved verbatim, which often are kind of confusing documents. But I took care when I edited them to preserve the characteristic voice and meaning of uh, the speakers. I made changes, uh, some changes to grammar, again, for readability but some grammatical variation was retained in order to preserve the dialect of the speaker. And where words were added to enhance the meaning, and I added the words, I put them in brackets, so it's very clear what I added as opposed to what the speaker would have said. To maintain the storyline, I reorganized the flow of the conversations sometimes, uh, especially where there were multiple interviews. And I also added the section headings. So in 2017, when all of these things were done to the 36 narratives, uh, I mean 2017, uh, the, uh, uh, the interviews and the, the life history narrative itself were given to uh, the living uh, uh, narrators for their approval, their final approval. So uh, they approved what went into the book. And then uh, that summer, we did uh, editing sessions in the fellowship hall, the basement of the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church uh, on a weekly basis and uh, invited all members of the community to come who wanted to, uh, and of course, the members of the Junaluska Heritage Association to those editorial meetings. We read through the life history narratives and <clears throat> and um, made sure that they said what we wanted them to say. So they largely remained intact. The people were not, uh, did not eliminate content so much. What they were primarily interested in was that people's names were spelled correctly and that the kinship relationships that were, in, that were spoken about were accurate. Uh, so those were corrected uh, where they found mistakes. And then in 2018, uh, 
I worked with them to collect photographs from the book. I think there's something like 44 photographs in the book. And um, these came from residents' uh, own personal photograph collections, from the Junaluska Heritage Association photograph files, from Digital Watauga, which many of you might know is a, is a, a website with, with photographs, historic photographs from uh, Watauga County. And also uh, photographs from our own uh, Lonnie Webster, uh, who is a resident of Blowing Rock and who took photographs at a number of the events that we hosted in June Leska. So I want to speak briefly now a little bit about the uh, history of June Leska and um, beginning with slavery and its aftermath. Um, slaves were never numerous in Watauga County. In 1850, there were 39 slaveholders and they held a total of 129 slaves. Uh, the largest slaveholders were Jordan Council Jr. and Boone and John Whittington in Cove Creek, who had 11 uh, slaves apiece. Council's store and home were located near the corner of Depot Street and King Street, right downtown. What is downtown today? Um, and Junaluska is located, of course, on the hill above that. So very close. Uh, let me share a photograph. This is a 1954 photograph from Digital Watauga of the town of Boone. And you can see uh, downtown at the lower part of the screen. Uh, and uh, you, you can see Depot Street going up the hill on the right hand side. And then the cluster of homes to the left of Depot Street. Uh, is what is where Junaluska is, uh, and the um, large white uh, building in that at the top of that cluster of homes is the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church. And then off to the left on the photograph is the historic uh, Methodist Episcopal Church that was uh, uh, demolished right next to the water tower there. And then uh, Junaluska Road is, you can see going up the mountain at the top. And you can see that the, you know, above uh, Junaluska was, uh, Howard's Knob was largely clear cut and uh, consisted of farmland uh, and agricultural fields. So, um, after emancipation, uh, many former slaves in Watauga County became sharecroppers, uh, and uh, some of them were allowed to clear land and keep a portion, and others bought uh, land. Of course, property around the turn of the 20th century was very cheap at that time, especially on the hillside, which was considered undesirable for farming. Um, and um, so this, uh, this was out of this uh, became uh, the uh, community of Junaluska that we know today. Uh, several um, Junaluska residents claim uh, Native American ancestry. And uh, the name Junaluska was, of course, the name of the leader, uh, the last leader of the Eastern Band of Cherokee in Western North Carolina. And of course, it's also the name of the road, Junaluska Road, that goes uh, on the outskirts of the community and up the up Howard's Knob. So the community's name may have come from any one or all of these uh, origins. Uh, it's, it's unclear. The residents of Junaluska refer to the community as the hill and the mountain. So the hill is the cluster of homes that you see on, in the photograph. And uh, the mountain refers to the people who live on up Junaluska Road or the top of Howard's Knob. Junaluska has been called a village within a village because historically, of course, it was a segregated neighborhood. Um, and residents tended to confine their activities and their relationships to their own people. Everything could be found in the community. Uh, 
their churches, their schools. They had small businesses. Everything could be found except employment. And much of that was found just outside of the community in downtown Boone or on the farms above. So the community functioned as one big family. Uh, they were interrelated in multiple ways and uh, they relied on reciprocal aid and mutual support to get through life's challenges. I want to show you a few pictures from the 1940s, 1950s, which was sort of the, um, the era that when June Luska was flourishing. This is Clarence Moore. He was, <coughs> excuse me, hauling coal for, uh, which I believe he got from uh, Reverend Rhonda Horton's uh, coal and ice business on Depot Street. And uh, he lived in uh, the Bethel area, I believe. So he was delivering coal to many places. This is the chocolate bar. The building where the, the, that housed the chocolate bar is actually still in existence. It's uh, across Depot Street from the public library. It's now used as a, it's a cement block building used as a storage facility for Austin and Barnes funeral home. Um, although it's called a bar, liquor was not served there. But this is a picture of a celebration that was being held to as a fundraiser for the uh, local baseball team, the Mountain Lions. And uh, this is a picture of the Mountain Lions baseball team. So uh, in the 40s and 50s, this was the heyday of local uh, baseball teams. And uh, there were a number of local ba baseball teams in Watauga County. And the Mountain Lions played both black and white teams. Um, so as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, unique to Western North Carolina is the cluster of African-American Mennonite Brethren churches. Uh, the Mennonite missionaries came to uh, the region around the turn of the century, of the 20th century, and established an orphanage and a school in Elk Park, North Carolina. Uh, and then also 13 uh, Mennonite Brethren churches, not all of which uh, still survive today, but one of them, the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church, is still here and it's very active and it is one of the largest of the Mennonite Brethren, African American Mennonite Brethren churches. And it, uh, as, as Willard mentioned, has provided one of the few avenues for leadership for African Americans in the area. And this is a picture of Reverend Rhonda Horton, who uh, was one of the first uh, ministers ordained by the Mennonite missionaries. And he helped to found several Mennonite Brethren churches in the area. He pastored the uh, Boone Mennonite Brethren Church for many decades, and he was the moderator for the uh, African American uh, Mennonite Brethren Conference in Western North Carolina for 36 years. This is a picture of, in 1918, the Boone Mennonite Brethren Church when it was first constructed. And uh, here is a picture of the church today. It's on Church Street, <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, and here is a picture of the uh, June Luska Gospel Choir. This is at one of the Jubilees and the photographs by Lonnie Webster. Uh, and the, um, the choir sings uh, Sundays uh, during services, of course. Of course, now they're meeting virtually, and so I don't think the choir is necessarily singing now for the, for the services, but uh, typically they do. And, uh, and they've also uh, gone to sing at revivals and at churches elsewhere in the county. Oh, they're very popular. 
So uh, now I want to turn things back over to uh, Roberta, who's going to read from a couple of the um, life history narratives uh, from the book. And I believe the first one that she's going to speak about is, uh, read from, is uh, Reverend Rhonda Horton. Thank you, Sue. When I looked through the book to decide who I would read about, I picked two of the people that I really remember, really love, that are no longer here. Because I think to go forward, you have to look back. So Reverend Rhonda Horton was born in 1895 and died in 1986. So I had personal knowledge of him while he, well, while I was here. In the book, it says, I was born in 1895 in Boone. My family home was on what is now Queen Street. There wasn't a name for the street back then. North Street was just a lane. There were only five or six black families up on the hill when I was a boy. The fa families of Albert Horton, Bob Shearer, Troy Council, Gus Horton, Emmer Horton, and my father, June Horton. All Boone had was Main Street, now King Street, and a short street down towards the teacher's college that ran down by the bus station, which they call Back Street. Main Street was just a muddy road with no pavement and the sidewalks were plank. There were just, there were just four or five little wooden stores there on Main Street including the dime store and belts department store. There were two hotels, the old Critcher Hotel and the Blair Hotel. There was a two-story brick building rooming house where Boone Drug stood. All the rest of the land around there was just farmland, pastures, and corn patches. Then he said, uh, Boone in the early 20th century. I remember when they first began to put gravel on the streets at the close of World War I because I helped haul and lay that gravel. We were using horses at the time that had been sold by the army when the war ended. The gravel came from the Cranberry ore mines in Avery County. They shipped it here on the Tweetsie Railroad. Then he, remembering my parents, my father was June Horton. His mother, Appeline Horton, was a slave in Caldwell County on the Yakin River. That's where he was born, just about the close of the Civil War. His ma mother died when he was a little boy and he was brought to Watauga County and raised by his oldest brother. My mother was Betty Grimes, and she was born in Boone. Her mother was not a slave. She was born in this vicinity, and she, never count, she was never counted in the census as a Negro. My grandmother's name was Polly Grimes, and she was just about as white looking as anybody. I don't know anything much about her parents, but I don't think her parents were slaves. Of course, she didn't pass for white. She passed as a colored woman, but her family was Indians and white people. And he had a pretty, uh, Reverend Horton had a pretty long narrative, but I just want to go to the end of his narrative where he talked about race relations. He said, when I was a boy, I was taught that white people hated black people, and the white children were taught that blacks were mean. So the two races had nothing to do with each other. Once integration came along, the children of both races found out their parents had misled them. Now it's the parents who have the problem in adjusting. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the greatest men who ever lived in America. I admire the spirit with which he went about the job and took the pressure. In the old days, even if a black person had a good car, he could not easily go where he needed. 
A filling station operator might not sell him gas, and he could not eat in a restaurant. Brother Siemens and I went to Kansas one time, and this is Brother Siemens from the uh, Mennonite Church. In Nashville, Tennessee, the white Texaco operator told us that the restrooms were out of order, but when we went in, they were in perfect order. We learn, learned in Jim Crow days that you could get service at a standard oil station, an Esso station. The Reverend Siemens would not go back to a Texaco station. He was against segregation. The Reverend Siemens drove us to California in the 1950s. We couldn't get anywhere to spend the night, so he outsmarted them. He would drive up to a hotel and go in and get a key. Then we'd all join him in the room and leave early the next morning. We traveled a lot and we had to ride in the back of the bus and train too. Our train car was never clean. Black people would crowd into a little waiting room in the station while the whites had a big place to sit. When we stopped at a restaurant, Reverend Siemens had to spit, eat out in front with a linen tablecloth and me and my wife had to eat in the kitchen on a newspaper spread on the table. But we were both charged 65 cents. I had a white friend who was a fox hunter. I told him, paint your face back and try to cross America. This fellow told me that he was opposed to Martin Luther King's marching in the streets and he ought to be in jail. I realized that this man was not really a friend. But when people saw segregation coming, they accepted it. It was much better here than in Atlanta, Georgia. We went there for a race relations meeting in the 1960s. People were surprised to hear that things were rather good in Boone. And then the next person, uh, and her life history is a lot shorter, that impressed me was Gertrude Folk. She was born in 1892 and died in 1974. I was born in Jefferson City, Tennessee. I don't recall my age, I don't tell my age to everybody, but I was born in 1982, 1892. My father's name was Jerry Talbot and mother's name was Mary. There were six of us in the family. My, my four sisters are Clemmy, Carrie, Adele, and Anna. There's just three living now. My parents weren't slaves, but my grandparents were. My parents never went to school. Back in those days, they didn't have the chance. I don't remember anything about my grandparents. Coming to Boone to teach. I went to Nelson's Murray School, a segregated high school right across the street from Carson Newman College in Jefferson City. When we had programs, our president would, would invite someone from Carson Newman to make a speech, or people like Daniel J. Whitener, former professor of history and social studies, Appalachian State Teachers College. He used to come up there and make speeches, and he'd have extra programs. I attended college at Nelson Mary. They, they just had two years then. Mr. B.B. Daugherty was the one that got me to teach in Boone. We all went to a conference in Johnson City, Tennessee, and Mr. Daugherty was one of them on one of them committees. He asked for someone to teach in Watauga County. When I came to Boone in 1918, they said I had to take some tests. Well, I went down to his office, and when I got down there, we talked just like we're talking now. So he kept talking and he talked and talked about the schools. And then I was done for the day. And I said, Dr. Dartery, when are we going to get my test? When are you going to give me my test? He said, I done give it to you. He said, while I was asking you all them questions, that was the test. I thought I'd have to take it on paper. Then after about three or four days, he gave me the chance to teach in Beaver Dam, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Um, let me also uh, just end with uh, the fact that the book is, a, <clears throat> is available uh, from uh, on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble and also uh, 
at uh, the, the publisher's website, McFarland Books. It's up there on the chat, McFarlandBooks.com. So if you're interested, uh, there should be plenty of copies available. <laughs>